what the east coast of Corsica towards Bastia and the first sprint finish of this year's race. Of course, wind is one of many factors on the race that can't be controlled. Unless you're Chris Baldwin, he spent time in the wind tunnel for us this year, making his own weather and drawing some fascinating conclusions. It was because of a book written in 1961 and a trout we find ourselves standing here in the wind tunnel of Southampton University, also home to Great Britain cycling team's secret squirrel club. And it was a member of that clandestine organisation, Rob Lewis, an aerodynamicist, who, on first seeing a picture of a sleek time trial machine, instantly asked me why there were so many cables dangling in the wind, because cylinders, he said, in airflows are bad. He then sent me this book, marked at two particular pages, because he wanted me to see two particular pictures. The first image showed a wire next to a proper aerofoil section, the shape of which, despite being many times the size, was so much better it offered the same air resistance. Rob postulated that if the wire was scaled up to the same size as bicycle brake cables, they'd cause the same drag as dangling a couple of trout off the handlebars. And from that point on, like the fish, I was hooked. In past years, we've done a little bit to try and illustrate the impact of airflow on the sport of cycling. But this year, we've got more sophisticated. And to help us answer our bag full of airflow-related questions, we've got some high-tech equipment, some experts on aerodynamics, and of course, Ned. Now, Ned is riding into a 44 km an hour headwind, about what you'd expect in the closing stages of a tour day. To sustain this, a rider of his size would need to be producing about 400 watts. In short, it would be absolutely on the limit. Now, we put a rider in front of Ned. His power demand to ride at the same speed drops a whopping 49%. That's two and a half thousand calories over the course of a tour day. Put a couple of teammates in front of him, that can easily drop another 20%. And back in the amorphous mass of athletes, there's times in a tour day when he can be riding at zero watts, while the man on the front is pulling his tripes out. So being so close to the man in front offers massive and measurable advantages. But what if it starts raining, Ned's a little bit nervous about riding so close to the wheel in front and starts to leave a gap. With every centimetre further away from the wheel Ned gets, that erodes his benefit. And that's sideways too. If Ned wants to see where he's going in a tightly packed bunch, well that's going to cost him a lot as well. So now you know why riders travel so close to the man in front, even in treacherous conditions. Why riders weave around the road chasing the camera motorbike or use the cars to get sucked back to the bunch after a puncture and why the sprinters have to wait until the last possible moment until coming out of shelter. Is the missile going to hit his target for the 21st time? And yes, he does! These are aero interactions in their crudest and simplest form. A bit of aero knowledge known to most riders intuitively. You get a bit closer, it gets easier. You get further away, it gets harder. Well, it might be simplistic, but this is going to govern most of the behaviour you see in this bike race over the next few weeks. 